Hello, uh, welcome back. Saturday morning, the second, third actual day of our uh, neurophenomenology and secular architecture um, towards uh, an experimental theological aesthetic symposium at uh, the Catholic University of America in Washington, DC. Good to have you here still. Uh, we have also more activities happening in the, in the afternoon. Um, uh, in order to, for us to prepare, for, especially for the last uh, session, which is kind of an open discussion, I kind of warn uh, the speakers that I'll have uh, you two for a minute, uh, each one of you. I'm going to go through the through the uh, the list, and uh, for in a minute you're going to have to tell me or tell us because it's for everybody. Um, what I, what is the takeaway? What what is that you learn from this uh, symposium? Of course, you know many things, but maybe just one or two. And then, if there is any question that you like to bring up, and then that that will generate enough critical mass of of thought and um, inquiry, perhaps to to kind of uh, speed up uh, a bigger discussion among all of us, including, of course, the attendees. So just be ready for that that question. Okay, so uh, let me now introduce uh, today, this morning speaker, Gordon Graham, which I'm very pleased to have, and thank you for coming all the way from Scotland, really appreciate it. Uh, Gordon is chair of the Edinburgh Sacred Art Foundation. Um, he's a emeritus professor of philosophies and the arts and at Princeton Theological Seminary and fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, Scotland's premier academy of science and letters. He taught philosophy at the University of St. Andrews and was a Richards Professor of Moral Philosophy at the University of Aberdeen from 1996 to 2006. He has published extensively on a wide range of philosophical topics and his books include Philosophy of the Art, um, the third edition um, in 2005, The Reenchantment of the World, 2007, and Philosophy, Art and Religion uh, in 2017. Welcome Gordon to the podium. Thank you very much. And perhaps I could just begin by uh, saying thank you to Julio and all his assistants in organizing uh, this event. I'm very uh, glad to be here. Uh, two things to start with. Once I have no pictures, which I regret actually, because they've been so beautiful to look at, so many pictures, but I don't have any. Technically, uh, Gordon said that uh, he was behind um, in the uh, technological scientific advances that, that people have been making, well, not as far behind as I am, uh, and even further behind, uh, but also behind in a different way. I want to think about the underlying philosophical issues. And we're recording a Zoom webinar. Mm -hmm. no, we're good. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. So uh, I'm behind in this sense that I'm interested myself in the sort of philosophical fundamentals of much that is going on. And uh, I wanted to start actually with a reflection about the underlying philosophy uh, in, of the Templeton Foundations uh, who put up all this money for so many people here. Between 1984 and 1996, Sir John Templeton endowed three major foundations with the express purpose of advancing human understanding by making significant financial resources available for innovative intellectual research. Today, these three organizations, the Templeton Religion Trust, which was in fact the first to be founded, they're not the first to start, the Templeton Religion Trust, the John Templeton Foundation, and the Templeton World Charity Foundation have endowments whose combined value runs to many billions of dollars. And this enables them to distribute large grants for research projects, but it's a key condition of receiving a grant from any of these benefactions that the research envisaged accords with Sir John's founding intention, namely to make progress in the investigation of spiritual reality by employing scientific methods. There is considerable latitude uh, in the interpretation of this intention, of course, and TRT, JTF, and the Charity Foundation have significantly different emphases. 
Many grants have been given for research topics of common interest to theology and science, others for related topics in ethics and metaphysics, and investigations in the psychology and sociology of religion, neuroscience, religious experience, and uh, more recently, the arts. The variety is striking, but it is constrained by an overarching requirement. The benefactor's intention must be honored. Consequently, though Templeton-funded research topics may be relatively disparate, they must always somehow properly fall under the general description, investigating spiritual reality scientifically. In this uh, paper, I propose to honor Sir John's intention in a different way by analyzing and exploring the intellectual vision that lay behind it. This vision was set out at some length in his book, The Humble Approach, first published in 1981. And it's on that text and one other that I will focus. At the outset, though, two caveats are in order. First, Sir John was not a philosopher or a theologian, nor an academic of any kind, as a matter of fact. And his book is interesting, it's fluent, it's thoughtful, it's well informed, but it isn't and cannot be treated as a systematic treatise in theology, philosophy, or cultural theory. So my aim is neither to expound its message, <laughs> nor to pick it apart, but rather to ask in a more general way, how some of its key concepts are best to be construed. Secondly, the book reveals assumptions and enthusiasms that were more plausible 40 years ago than they are now. For example, it's grounded in a progressive conception of history, and it takes progress in the natural sciences to be the hallmark of intellectual progress in general. I think people are less sanguine about human progress now than he was then, especially if we expect uh, progress to emerge from a rising level of education and enlightenment across the globe. This doesn't seem entirely how things have gone. Furthermore, Templeton attributes success in the natural sciences to a scientific mindset. I quote, natural scientists are more open-minded, competing with each other in professional rivalry guided by relatively tolerant and open minds. And it's an important part of his contention that this, as he sees it, scientific attitude contrasts with, quote, the closed-minded attitude that is more evident amongst theologians, religious leaders, and lay people who are, he says, frequently blind to the obstacles they themselves erect. The history of science, though, does not really confirm his view. And actually, of course, Thomas Kuhn's famous book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, predates um, Templeton's remarks, uh, but I don't suppose he ever saw that book. The history of science does not confirm his optimism, if that's what it is. Even scientists acknowledged to be of the highest caliber have held tenaciously to theories that were shaped by personal commitments, institutional affiliation, and vested research interests. Sometimes research follows the money, for example. So the open-mindedness that Templeton rightly treasures is by no means a universal feature of the natural sciences. And conversely, dogmatism is not always the mark of theologians or the mark of theologians alone. Indeed, it's worth observing that much modern theology has abandoned any division between the orthodox and the heretical in the name of open-mindedness. And to some minds, I might add, it has thereby lost whatever moorings it once had. Still, if some of Templeton's claims reflect the presuppositions of his time and place, this doesn't diminish the interest of his key contention, namely that knowledge and understanding of spiritual reality can progress significantly if the tried and tested methods of scientific inquiry are employed. 
To understand this contention, however, and to assess its cogency, we need to address two philosophical questions. First, what is spiritual reality? And secondly, what methods are properly regarded as scientific? With regard to the first of these questions, the humble approach, the book, The Humble Approach, offers us a few pointers. We are only now, Templeton says, beginning to find evidence of quote, dimensions of reality which transcend the invisible space-time field, which holds together within its astonishing configuration all that man can observe in space and time. And he speaks of experience at the frontiers of knowledge, catching glimpses of unexpected aspects of reality. What is the nature of these unexpected aspects? Templeton regularly invokes a contrast between, quote, this material world and the spiritual world, of which he says we are citizens. A large part of the point of this, uh, this distinction is to reject philosophical materialism. That is to say, reject the supposition that what we call the spiritual is ultimately a product of neurophysiological processes in the brain. So at least some of the investigations that people might conduct are not easily squared uh, with Templeton's aspirations. Spiritual realities, he says, find their ultimate expression in a realm outside and beyond these earthly confines. These uh, spiritual metaphors outside and beyond might be taken as evidence that Templeton's rejection of materialism leads him to endorse metaphysical dualism, the view that there are two ontologically different worlds, the world of the natural and the world of the supernatural. The natural, on this way of understanding, is the ordinary world of sights and sounds, while the supernatural is an extraordinary world inhabited by souls, angels, divinities, and God. This extraordinary world requires a no less extraordinary means of apprehension, one that goes beyond the five senses and relies on mystical visions, divine revelation, extrasensory perception, and the like. Metaphysical dualism of this kind is philosophically problematic. Chief amongst its problems is the impossibility of explaining the relation between the natural and the supernatural. Persons are both bodies and souls. If these are ontolog ontologically distinct entities, how could there be any connection between them? Descartes, René Descartes' famous attempt to locate the connection in the pineal gland speedily reveals the problem. The pineal gland is part of a material organism. To claim that at the same time it is the seat of the spiritual soul explains nothing. It simply reasserts the proposition it is intended to amplify, namely that human beings are both bodies and souls. The connection between matter and spirit remains opaque. If spirit and matter have different ontologies, it doesn't seem as though they could be related. I might just say here, of course, it's a very large topic, topic about mind and body, mind and brain, but there's a strong tendency in some courts of cognitive science actually for what's called a limited materialism, in which the mind and the soul are to be eliminated uh, and displaced by the brain. And we will really finally understand what everything is all about uh, when we grasp brain functions. Of course, the difficulty with that is that we have to understand brain functions and that understanding is not itself a behavior in the brain. The humble approach I want to say, avoids the problem of ontological dualism. 
Templeton doesn't actually use the distinction between natural and supernatural, but he expressly emphasizes the interconnection between them. The approach he is advocating, he says, sees an intimate relationship of physical and spiritual reality. And he adds that this intimacy exists, quote, whether we are students of the natural or the supernatural. And later in the book, he writes that, quote, what is required to draw science and religion together is the disclosure of the naturalness of the supernatural, even as the contribution of science to religion is the vindication of the naturalness of the supernatural. So the gift of religion to science is the demonstration of the supernaturalness of the natural. These expressions, the naturalness of the supernatural and the supernaturalness of the natural, could be construed as oxymoronic formulations that simply dodge the issue. But I think it would be a mistake to dismiss them in this way. Though Templeton himself does not refer to metaphysical dualism, these phrases can be taken as signaling a determination to reject dualism, no less than materialistic monism. Both dualism and monism, or at least materialistic monism, conflict with the essential integrity of the material and the spiritual worlds. Human beings are undoubtedly biological organisms, but they're also, in Templeton's phrase, citizens of the spiritual world. Quote, as human beings, we are endowed with mind and spirit. We think, imagine, and dream. We are spirits, he says, from the day of our conception. And this implies, of course, that our process to maturity integrates organic and spiritual development. I quote again, love, loyalty, patience, and mercy are more real than tangible objects. And God seeks to instill these spiritual realities into our lives in the here and now, end quote. We can throw some light on what it means to say that the spiritual is natural and the natural is spiritual. If we focus on one of temples and examples of spiritual reality, namely love. Consider, for instance, the relationship between sexual desire and romantic love. Lust and love are equally real features of human existence. And we share sexual desire and its satisfaction with many other creatures. In the case of human beings, however, lust can be transformed by love. Transformation in this sense is not elimination. It is rather the integration of biological activity into a human relationship. And this integration results in a dimension of meaning and value beyond that of simple desire satisfaction. And the same point can be made about the love between parent and child. In common with many animals, biological evolution has given human beings both maternal and filial instincts. These instincts successfully guide the nurture of the infant. But as, times pass, as time passes, they fade to the point where parent and offspring go their separate ways. In the case of human beings, however, these instincts do something more, or can do anyway. They form the basis of a developing personal relationship, which then transforms them. The biological instincts that grandmothers and great-grandmothers once possessed have long since been replaced by similar instincts in a new generation. Yet, grandmothers and great-grandmothers nevertheless remain mothers to their sons and daughters, and it is in these personal relationships that the value and meaning of love is realized. Templeton, in common with an established way of thinking, locates spiritual realities on a developmental trajectory, one that both transcends material causality and biological death. Spiritual realities, he says, find their ultimate expression in a realm outside and beyond these earthly confines. That is how God ultimately enters the picture. 
Yet it's important to know that this way of thinking does not make spiritual realities exotic or occult. They are aspects of our ordinary experience, even if their fulfillment, their ultimate fulfillment, necessarily lies beyond it. We should conclude then, I claim, that the philosophical understanding of human experience, which informs the intention behind Templeton's remarkable benefactions, offers a reasonably coherent conception of the integration of the natural and the supernatural. Templeton makes no claim to philosophical novelty. Indeed, my reconstruction of the basic, behind, basic idea behind his book, The Humble Approach, shares the aim of many philosophical predecessors, namely an attempt to overcome the apparently exclusive choice between metaphysical materialism and metaphysical dualism. And in so doing, to avoid the philosophical difficulties that both sides of that division encounter. So I don't think there's anything especially novel about Templeton here, nor indeed anything especially novel about my amplification of it. But all of it is bound, I mind certainly, by the idea that metaphysical dualism and metaphysical monism have major problems in making sense of human beings. So we better find some other account. Greater novelty in Templeton's uh, <clears throat> writings lies in his claim that our understanding of spiritual reality can be furthered by scientific methods of investigation. And this idea is distilled in this concept of experimental theology, which of course appears here. This is, he tells us, <clears throat> the study of unseen spiritual realities by concentrating on observable data resulting from spiritual events, changes and differences in physical phenomena. And I think that description probably covers a lot of what we've been hearing about what people are engaged in. And as befits the general theme of a humble approach, Templeton is modest in his aspirations for this. Quote, experimental theology can reveal only a very little about God. It begins with a few simple forms of inquiry, subject to little disagreement, and it proceeds to probe more deeply in thousands of other ways. Spiritual realities are not quantifiable, of course, but there may be aspects of spiritual life which can be demonstrated experimentally, one by one, even though there be hundreds of failures for each success. This approach, he says, is similar to that of experimental medicine, end quote. He then goes on to offer us a number of potential research projects. And the list includes the phenomenon, phenomenon of being born again, as well as the phenomenon of comparative rates of healing between believers and non-believers. These are his examples of what he was hoping eventually uh, researchers funded by him would look into. I, I just quote again, when people are born again or filled with the spirit, they say they are no longer the same. Has anyone subjected uh, such changes to rigorous testing? Scientists might be able to detect visible evidence about how the Holy Spirit alters or improves the lives of people who say they are filled by it. And then his second example, quote, some doctors agree that the patient's rate of healing after having the same operation varies as greatly as 300% among different people. In addition to studying the biological, anatomical, chemical, and psychological reasons for this, studies into the religious attitudes of patients might show a correlation between spiritual conviction and physical recovery. So those are two of the actual examples he gives, and I wouldn't be at all surprised to know that Templeton funded research had addressed those. I don't know it for a fact, but I wouldn't be surprised. But the problem with these research projects and with all the others that Templeton himself suggests is not that they 
can, quote, can reveal only a very little about God, but rather that they can't be taken to reveal anything at all about God. That is because the differences that rigorous scientific investigation may detect, even if they prove interesting and substantial, could only be interpreted as the impact of belief in God. Perhaps it's true uh, that believing in the providential oversight of a loving God does indeed have valuable psychological and physiological benefits. But this general proposition about human beings, even if it's true, doesn't show that our lives are providentially governed, that God is love, or even that God exists. It only shows that belief in these things is often beneficial. And this is clear in the example of being born again, his example. Scientists might indeed be able to detect visible evidence of change and improvement in the lives of people who say they are filled with the Holy Spirit. But contrary to Templeton's assumption, this wouldn't show that the cause of the alteration and improvement in their behavior was the work of the Holy Spirit. A correlation uncovered by scientific investigation in this respect might be interesting and even important, but its underlying explanation would remain unknown. The evidence, however extensive, is quite compatible with its having a purely material basis. In short, or so I claim, experimental theology as Templeton conceives it encounters an evidential gap. The benefits of religious belief and practice, however well established, provide no evidence that God is at work in the world. They only show that what we believe can make a difference to our well being. And as a general truth, this hardly counts as a novel discovery. In uh, what follows in my remaining remarks, I seek to close this gap between belief and reality, but to do so in a way that while departing in some respects uh, from the concept of experimental theology outlined in the humble approach, is I think in other respects continuous with it. And moreover, it opens up a space within that vision for art and the aesthetic, which is ultimately what I am interested in. While Templeton's concept of experimental theology is novel, his general contention about scientific method is not. His belief that the demonstrable success of natural science gives us good reason to use its methods in areas of inquiry where progress and understanding is much less evident is precisely the contention that underlie, underlay many of the innovative inquiries initiated by Enlightenment philosophers. David Hume, who lived from 1711 to 76, is the most famous and uh, probably the most influential example of this. His treatise of human nature, which was published in 1739-40, was expressly built on extending the experimental methods of the natural sciences to the science of human nature. And while he later dissociated himself from this relatively youthful work to some degree, uh, in reworking it, it was this treatise of human nature that set the agenda for philosophical and scientific inquiry for at least a century thereafter. And my, I might say um, it's striking parallel. I mean, uh, Hume and his contemporaries were terrifically struck by the progress in science made, especially by Newton, but also by Bacon and the Baconian methods and the Newtonian methods were precisely what they were trying to emulate uh, as they turned from natural philosophy to what they called moral philosophy, which is essentially the study of the soul. <clears throat> One of these Enlightenment thinkers, 
highly regarded in his own day, but now virtually unknown, possibly unknown for everyone except me, <laughs> was Alexander Gerard. And he was a Scottish Enlightenment philosopher and theologian, as well as a very influential clergyman and educational reformer. And Gerard wrote two major philosophical works. One was entitled An Essay on Taste, and the other An Essay on Genius. And it's the second of these works that seems to me relevant to the themes of Templeton's humble approach. The etymology of the word genius is spirit. While for contemporary speech, as indeed for Gerard, genius refers to a special capacity for creativity, its original connotation is preserved in the associated concept of inspiration, being filled with the spirit. And it is with that association that the suggestion that genius draws a spiritual or unusual spiritual source resides. Jared's own essay on genius is clearly shaped by Hume's agenda in the treatise, and he makes occasional references to that. But Hume himself only fleetingly refers to genius though he does link it to imagination. And it's this connection between genius and imagination that Gerard explores at length, and I think illuminatingly. He identifies four active powers or faculties in the human mind, <laughs> sensation, memory, judgment, and imagination. That's to say the abilities to sense, across all the senses, to remember, to assess or evaluate, and to invent. By Jared's account, genius is essentially a very high level exercise of the imagination. Conscious experience for all of us, he argues, does not consist solely in the things we presently see, hear, feel, or taste. There is also a constant flow of associated ideas, some of them remembered and some of them imagined. If our minds were confined to immediate sensation as those of even the most sophisticated animals are, we couldn't engage in history, philosophical reflection, scientific inquiry, or artistic creativity. All these activities require the ability to call up and to consider thoughts and ideas that are not immediately present, and then to seek connections between them. Genius, in Jared's account, is the ability to do this to a highly productive degree. It's genius that enables us to uncover and explore new and surprising connections between quite apparently disparate phenomena. It requires a no less important exercise of judgment, however, which is to say an ability to assess the meaningfulness of the <clears throat> connections that we imagine. We have to assess the intellectual significance of the products of imagination. And it's by that assessment that we determine uh, what separates imagination from mere fancy. Uh, this is how Jared thinks thought progresses and science requires genius, no less than storytelling. It was, he thinks, genius that made Isaac Newton's scientific achievements so remarkable. It was his imagination that famously postulated a connection between two seemingly wholly unrelated phenomena, namely an apple falling from a tree and the movements of the heavenly bodies. At the same time, having made this a connection in his imagination, it was Newton's astute scientific judgment that enabled him to assess its significance. So imaginative genius prompted his astonishing achievement and judgment confirmed its value for the natural sciences. Jared then accords a key role to imaginative genius in science, no less than in the arts, but he thinks that art and science are importantly different. They serve different ends, he thinks, that the end of science is truth, whereas the end of art is beauty. For present purposes, I'm going to set aside the question of beauty's relation to truth, because Jared makes striking use of the arts in another way, 
as a source of evidence, evidence for his exploration of the mind and its faculties. So his own writings are explorations of the mind. And they are, I might say, uh, phenomenological primarily. They're attempts at a systematic structured description of the human mind uh, and the operation of its uh, structuring faculties. <clears throat> so whatever is to be said about taste and truth or beauty and truth, I'm going to leave that aside. And just notice that in calling evidence, uh, calling upon evidence <laughs> for his uh, phenomenological description of the human mind, uh, he draws very extensively on Shakespeare's plays, uh, with which I might say he had an astonishingly impressive familiarity. And using the evidence of the plays, uh, uh, both the poetry and the characterization, very occasionally the plot line, uh, he assembles generalizations about casts of mind and personality. Shakespeare's own genius, of course, doesn't lie in tracing connections or formulating general laws based upon experimental evidence. Rather, Shakespeare has an outstanding power of imaginative insight into human character and motivation, as well as a mastery of language. And this mastery of language enables him to give expression to his insight in vivid description, imagined thought, rich dialectical exchanges. Shakespeare, of course, takes things to the highest order, but in this way, dramatists, novelists, and poets in general might be thought to provide the evidential base on which theorists like Gerard base their understanding of the human mind and soul. In Templeton's terminology, which Gerard would probably have endorsed, it's thanks to genius that our knowledge of spiritual realities, no less than physical realities, advances. Uh, uh, advances our understanding. Templeton's focus on science leaves him saying very little about the arts, at least in that book. In a, the introduction to a later collection of essays, which I think only contributed one, but he does, uh, he, he, the collection is in fact looking forward, he does actually note the rising importance of the arts. I quote, as our culture becomes increasingly global, he says, there is a parallel expansion of interest in the arts. And wherever the affluent information economy is spread, the need for examining the meaning of life through the arts will follow. And he goes on to remark that this accelerated search for intellectual nourishment, especially on the spiritual side of life, is a primary characteristic of our new era and its attitude to the arts. How might these uh, fleeting remarks of Templeton's relate to the scientific study of the spiritual uh, that he advocated in a humble approach? He doesn't make the connection. I think in the light of uh, Jared's account of genius that I outlined, it's possible to sketch a connection. Imaginative genius makes use of insight rather than survey or experiment. I take it uh, that most of what we've been hearing about is based on survey and experiment because these are the stock in trade of the natural and social sciences. But even if we take a highly empiricist perspective, such as Templeton's, then artistic genius can be incorporated into a process of thought that is properly described as scientific. That's because it can serve a scientific ambition, namely to arrive at true generalizations grounded in supporting evidence. The evidence doesn't drive from observation or experiment, but from the insights revealed and expressed in works of art. And the resulting generalizations relate to spiritual rather than physiological life. This doesn't imply that artists are in some sense scientists. Creative artists present their audience with specific objects for attention, not theories or generalizations to be reflected on. When characters in novels and plays and figures and drawings and paintings take on a general rather than individual character, they run the risk 
of being unimaginative stereotypes. So to claim that the pursuit of knowledge can seek evidence from artistic imagination is to say that works of art can serve as the evidential basis for generalizations about the life of the spirit as this is manifested in human beings. Facts about the life of the soul are grasped and presented by artistic imagination, just as facts about the life of the body are observed and theorized by biological and scientific imagination. Applied finally to the question of theology, these brief uh, remarks on the concept of artistic genius suggest a direction which you might profitably think further about the following question. How can exploring the relation between religion and the arts be conducted in accord with the ideas underlying Sir John Templeton's benefaction? Let us agree that there is such, this is contentious, but let us agree that there is such a thing as religious genius. That is to say that in the course of history, some people have exhibited a remarkable capacity for imaginative insight into the exercise of the religious mind. The insights embodied in the lives and teaching of figures such as, for example, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, have proved to have the ability to speak relevantly to vastly different audiences over very long stretches of time. In response to these insights, the arts in some of their manifestations have done what Shakespeare does. They've given them literary, visual, architectural, musical expression. Religious artworks of this kind do not in themselves advance theological understanding. Rather, they provide an evidential basis with which more structured theoretical reflection can work. With this thought in mind, it's worth repeating one of Templeton's own observations. Spiritual realities, he says, are not quantifiable, but there may be aspects of spiritual life which can be demonstrated experimentally. In the light of this remark and the foregoing reflections on art, I think we can usefully rephrase his concept of experimental theology slightly and construe it mainly as the study of unseen spiritual realities by concentrating on artistic expressions of spiritual events, changes, and differences. Templeton had many high hopes for experimental theology. He writes, Perhaps the advance into the realms of spiritual reality and progress in religion will be as outstanding and rapid as the astonishing advances in physics, astronomy, and genetics. Whether the amended conception of investigation I've been sketching might be able to sustain such ambition is a topic for another time. What it enables to say, I think, is that applied uh, to topics in religion and the arts, there is enormous resources made available as a result of Sir John Temple's conviction, at least in principle, be well used to sustain his intellectual designs. Thank you very much. So we're going to proceed like we have done in the past with the other lectures. We're going to have three respondents. So I'm going to ask the first respondent uh, to come and, uh, and comment on Gordon's uh, lecture. Um, that's going to be Robin Jensen. Uh, she's the Patrick O'Brien Professor of Theology at the University of Notre Dame, where she holds concurrent faculty position in the departments of art, art history, and design and classics. Her research and teaching mainly concentrates on the history of Christian art and architecture and integrates material evidence with lived religious practices. I could introduce myself a little bit more just for the sake of placing it. I, uh, I was an undergraduate major in studio art um, and I went on to study at Parsons School of Design for three years after that and integrated with my theolo theological education. I was also a student of drama and I taught high school drama for a whole while. And one of the quotes that really popped out at me as I was reading your essay you sent in advance comes from Midsummer Night's Dream. And you may know this one, it comes from King Theseus, I believe. And as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns then 
to shape and give to every nothing a local habitation and a name. That struck me as being very resonant with what you were talking about. Um, I'm going to set aside a couple of brief things because I know we don't want to dig in into them. And, and one of those would be as a theologian, my, um, my as a Christian theologian, the idea that Christian theologians could be kind of closed minded. I would point out that most Christian theology would also go along with Templeton's rejection of metaphysical dualism. <laughs> that would be one thing. Um, the other thing, and I know you wanted to set aside, is the relationship of, of truth and beauty. But the statement that science... Um, the end of science is truth and the end of art is beauty is very troubling to me, um, only because the word beauty often troubles me quite a bit um, when we tend to simplify it to mean something pleasant or pretty, because because art can be shocking or dangerous or uh, dis disturbing, um, as well as beautiful and uplifting, and, and those are also goals that art may have. But I wanted to turn to um, two, two things in the, toward the end of your presentation, Gordon, um, and sort of trouble them a little bit. I don't think we'd actually disagree, but I wanted to sort of, in, sort of think about it a little more. And one is the statement that artists are not, in some sense, scientists. Creative artists present objects for attention, um, for the audience or viewers to grasp, uh, not theories or generalizations to be reflected upon. And the second um, statement that I want to trouble a little bit is that religious artworks do not in themselves advance theological understanding. And that in themselves, I'm sure, is the where you would want to put some emphasis. But so to turning to that first statement, I want us to think about the fact that the the subjects, whether they're listening to music or the viewing, I'm a visual artist now primarily or work with visual arts, but so I think about viewers, but we could think about audiences um, of different kinds. They're not passive recipients just to grasp something that's presented to them. Um, they're very, the viewing and hearing is a very active engagement for most, most of audiences and, and not all viewers maybe. There's a sort of study that's been done that um, how much time does an average viewer spend looking at a, an artwork in a museum? And it turns out to be 17 seconds. 10 of those seconds happen to be reading the label, which leaves only seven seconds for average viewers to spend glancing at an artwork. So one of those things is possibly a question of how much one grasps in that time. Um, but there's, I was thinking about Elizabeth's earlier presentation and all these differences among viewers because some viewers will gaze. And there are going to be differences among the levels of attention that viewers or listeners pay to the art being presented to them. But that is, it's not a passive activity. It's a very engaged, it's a very, if it's at best, it's a very engaged one. Um, and that at the same time, there are going to be many, um, I forget the word you use, Elizabeth, but many differential uh, aspects to this, the, the health of the viewer, the state of mind, the mood, the, the what's happened in your day, how many people are around you, um, your age, your gender, your physiological being. Um, and you may come back the next day and have a different, entirely different experience. So we don't want to generalize, I think, too much about what that will be. And, and so the levels of attention, the in, internal resources that a viewer or a listener brings to the body or the work of art um, is, is extremely important. Um, we're not just worked upon, we're also doing that hard work if we're doing it well. So that's that's one thing. So I, I, I wanted sort of not to just think about the audience or the viewer as a kind of passive recipient of something presented. The second one is probably even more interesting to me, and that's the question of whether art can be explicitly theological. I think it can be, and I think it often is. Not all the time, well, maybe only rarely. But my best example of that is the difference is in ways that images of the crucifixion are presented to Christian viewers. And that changes a lot over time, and I know you know this, but you can have, and, and they're explicitly theological, and they're very formative, so that the um, the image of the crucifixion presents a theologically informed and informing interpretation of the event, and it, and it, it will change culturally, it will change over time, 
So my students who live in classrooms that have bloody crucifixes <laughs> with suffering Jesus on the wall and every classroom at Notre Dame University has one. Um, and I point to them all the time and I say, that's just one possibility of all the many ways of thinking about what crucifixion was and did and what the, there's no dogma for this. I mean, there's, there's actually one of the interesting things about what, what, uh, what we would call redemption theory isn't a dogma. Um, it, there's all kinds of thinking about it, but you can have a triumphant Christ on the cross. You can have a non-bleeding Christ on the cross. And these range and the earliest ones, in fact, didn't show suffering at all. In fact, there really wasn't even a crucifixion until image of this we know of until almost the, the fifth and sixth and seventh century and nothing suffering until the ninth or 10th or 11th. So these are explicitly theological. <laughs> They make explicit theological statements. Um, so I, I don't think we disagree on any of this. I'm just sort of trying to expand our thinking about what art does in terms of informing a spiritual understanding. And it has a lot to do with the viewer's level of engagement and, and who that viewer is. And then we're talking about visual art but we could be true about music, it could be true about theater, and also um, what the intention is, is expressed in the art, which well could be political or theological and certainly intellectual. And it's, it's not, it, to, to say that art is, it has, can't be expressly theological, I think I disagree with you on that. Thanks. Okay, then let me just make it quick. I don't want to take up more time uh, or leave us lots of time for general discussion. Just on your first point, uh, the lang my language is, is um, was not adequate enough. But um, so that's why I deliberately use terms like grasp and attention uh, rather than these are active terms, not passive terms. Um, might I just say that even then, uh, there's a, another range of considerations to bring in when we think about the performing arts. So music is first and foremost, in my view, to be played or sung, not to be listened to, the listening to, which is also active, but it's a, it's a, a secondary thing. So there's more to that, but I, I don't, or didn't mean for a moment to suggest uh, that those to whom things are presented are passive. Uh, on the, the second is a bigger topic, which we might return to. <laughs> Second respondent will be uh, Jonathan Berger. Uh, he's a Denning family provostial professor in music at Stanford University. Uh, he's a composer and researcher of music cognition. Uh, and he's a recent recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship and the Ron Prize. He currently leads a cross disciplinary study that you have seen. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon, for a wonderful talk. And I have to admit that I begged Robin to go before me. You notice everything is alphabetical, but I begged Robin to go before me because I had no clue what I was going to say, even having had Gordon's paper before me. Um, and I would love to riff on two of these things. And I'll, I'll just say that I disagree with your last comment about music being, um, I mean, the, it, there is no such thing as passive listening. Um, when, when a composer writes music, she then hands it off to an interpreter who does something entirely different with that music. I mean, for me as a composer, there's this wonderful moment where the music is no longer mine. It's, it's, it's the performers. And then the, that interpretation is passed on to a listener and the listener recomposes the music, right? So it's this constant, um, act of creation. And I think that that's, that's important to keep in mind here. Um, uh, although I plan to riff on what Robin said, I'm just gonna tell three quick stories that I think um, uh, address this tension between spirituality and science. And one or uh, two of those, and one that address the, uh, the strange tension between science and art. Um, the first is about Leonardo da Vinci. So Leonardo, um, it rejected the concept of uh, that was imposed by the church and commonly felt that um, that the soul is um, is something that's eternal and that um, and that lasts forever and it's inexplicably there's no single place for the soul in the body and Leonardo's um, spent a lot of time searching for where the soul is um, 
And of course, you know, the way Leonardo worked, worked was in bits and pieces. So you have to go through his entire set of notes and notebooks and string together this puzzle. So the puzzle goes like this. He spent a lot of time looking at the at vision, and then he spent some time looking at, at um, the auditory mechanism, and then even something about olfaction. So he has pieces where he, where he figures out um, sensory organs. And then he writes, the soul, the anime, is the place in the brain, so it's a physical location, that is the senso comune, the common sense. So the term common sense is Leonardo's point where all the senses come together and it's in one place in, this, in, in the brain. And he draws a, a, a schematic, he draws a diagram of it. So, um, so I'm always touched by this, by this idea that, um, that, that, um, that da Vinci was, was convinced that there has to be some physical manifestation for the brain. Of course, just before he died, he wrote his will. And in his will, he writes about when his soul, his eternal soul goes there. I mean, he, he then reverted to the, uh, the sort of the standard um, uh, Catholic notion of, of the eternity of the soul. The second story is about Johannes Kepler. So Kepler um, writes the, I and mean, this is a, this is something that sort of came up yesterday when we were talking about resonance and, and uh, so Kepler, Kepler writes about the, um, the, uh, the uh, orbital motion. And he comes up with this idea that also is contrary to uh, the theologic notion of, of, of the perfection of the universe, because he finds that the universe is is that that the way to explain it is helio is is um, not heliocentric. That um, that the universe is not about about um, about uh, sorry that 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 it is heliocentric. That the planets are orbiting around the sun, and that is his explanation. And um, and then he goes on and has the audacity to say that that orbital motion is not circular. It's not perfect. It's it's um, it's elliptical. And so to justify his notion, he had to come up with a plan that would convince the, uh, the church authorities that, um, that there is something perfect about it. And that plan was the harmony of the spheres, right? That the planets are creating this orbital motion and when they come to their, their particular points of distance and, 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 um, and nearness, that they are musical notes. And he then explains the harmony, these perfection of, of a harmony, the intervals that, that were talked about yesterday as being these perfect points of arrival of the orbits. And then at the end of his, the of his thesis, he writes something incredibly beautiful. I, I wish I didn't have to, um, have to uh, uh, riff on it, but rather I wish I could actually read it. But he says, essentially, um, to understand the, the beginning of the world, the beginning of the universe, one can go backwards with this motet. He calls it a motet, right? So he's ascribing a, a, a work of music to this notion of, of orbital motion and says, where the, where, the, where, the, um, where the planets come together in a single note, that's where, that's where um, the, uh, the universe started. So, um, so the third quick story, is about John Cage. So John Cage um, uh, was, uh, in, or, in addition to being a, a radical, wonderful thinker and an amazing composer, um, a composer of great sensitivity. We spend a lot of time worrying about his, his one four minutes and 33 seconds of silence, but he actually did things with sounds that were quite beautiful and quite amazing. Um, and I think four minutes and 33 seconds of silence is quite beautiful and quite amazing. But um, he was also a, a mycologist. He was, he was terribly interested in, in mushrooms. And he writes in, in one of his books an account of, of a story where he got, he, he brought, he, he tried to meet the best scientists in the field. And he brought together, he, he, he uh, invited uh, a very famous mycologist and, and they had spent an evening together. And he talks about the most of the evening being spent on on um, on cages, descri describing to this person how upset he was with the world of art 
where everyone is so catty and everyone is so competitive and they're always they're always at each other and, and how he needs to find a way around that. Um, and how wonderful it is that science is not that way. That it's this it's this sort of perfect universe where everyone gets along and 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 his guest agreed to him, agreed with him. Um, and then at the very end, John John Cage says he asks the his guest about the work of another mycologist. And he said, don't even mention his name in my presence. <laughs> Thank you. The last uh, respondent will be Anne Sussman. Um, she's an architect, author, and teacher. I'm passionate about understanding how buildings influence people. Her book, Cognitive Architecture, Designing for How We Respond to the Built Environment, published in 2021, uh, and co-author with uh, Justin Hollander, features color images of eye-tracking architecture. She's president of the Human Architecture and Planning Institute, thehappy.org. And Uh, thanks so much. Um, it was so fun to hear you talking about the scientific revolution and Templeton's interest in it. And it's like he predicted this would be happening because um, I think what I'm seeing now in all the talks we've had, um, it's really the impact of the game-changing time we're in and the new science that's available in the 21st century that wasn't in previous centuries. Um, one thing I'm struck about when I look at all this and try to synthesize it. How can I synthesize it Sim simply? It's, we're really looking at evolution and um, evolution's complicated. <laughs> and that's what you see when you'd see some of the research here. And one of the new things they knew and know in the neuroscience that's fascinating to me and that I think connects to this conference is our need for narrative. We're a storytelling species. Narrative brings people together. So there's often a, a reason that things happen. It turns out if you're part of a group that tells the same story, you're a stronger group. The connection, it's really interesting. It's about building connection and community. And I just find that, that really, really fascinating. And I also think that's what really we've been seeing with the great architecture here, the great churches and temples, the mosque, um, great art, pulls us together, great architecture pulls us together, and that has an evolutionary advantage for a social species. Um, there's, I'll end on this quote by a doctor who's fascinated um, and who sees this neuroscience revolution as changing our understanding really of, of healthcare. She writes, um, Nadine Burke Harris, MD, when you know the mechanism, you can use that understanding in countless ways to drastically improve the human condition. That is how you spark a revolution. You shift the frame, you change the lens, and all at once the world is revealed and nothing is the same. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, uh... Just with respect to Anne's remarks, I just allude to the theme that came up at the last session. I think there is a genuine question as to whether the enormous advances in technology and computing that have undoubtedly been the case have advanced the understanding of the things that people are trying to apply them to. I think I just re repeat the uh, query that was discussed at the last session. Just um, one, only one comment on John's. I, I never, I, I want to emphasize uh, the activity uh, in the, what I'll call the reception of art and underline it even more in the case of music than in visual art, though I think the reception of visual art also has to be active. The only point I was trying to make was that um, art and uh, music making is fundamental to uh, music uh, in a way, and this is why I have my reservations about four minutes, 33 seconds, but because I, I think um, if the idea of 40 minutes, 33 seconds is to attend to the sound around us, 
with the attention that we give to musical sound, uh, I just think that isn't possible actually. Whereas I do think that attending to a landscape in something like the way we attend to a picture is possible. So anyway, but that's just a small, a small point. Okay, so we're gonna open this now to the uh, audience. If you have any questions or comments on um, the talk today, please uh, raise your hand and we'll rush the microphones to you. Here, uh, Michael. Thanks. No, I, I would just li like to ask you, Gordon, to relate your, your talk more directly to um, architecture. I, I don't think you've grappled in your talk with the specifics of what for you makes a, a, a place sacred, um, to what extent that resides in the traditions of a particular religion. Um, and, and in terms of the Templeton bequest, um, it becomes very unclear to what extent he is moored within a particular religious tradition and, and, and to what extent one can have spiritual values apart from that grounding. Um, well, that, that's enough, I think, to get you going. Thanks. Just to, first, I, I think it's a mistake uh, to think that all church architecture is the creation of sacred space. Well, the attempt to create sacred space, as I suggested in previous discussion, sometimes church groups just want meeting places. They're not wanting sacred spaces. Secondly, I think uh, it's a mistake to identify uh, all holy places with sacred spaces. See, so the intentional creation of space. So a lot of people certainly uh, think of natural environments as the, the phrase often used is a thin place. They have, have a kind of aura uh, that suggests something, that hints something. And uh, I, I'm perfectly happy to think that um, experience of the sacred uh, does not require the intentional construction of sacred space. So when we now turn to the art of architecture, uh, then I think it, it's not in, a, in uh, so very different. I mean, I, I think architecture, uh, and the one the question that interests me, which uh, I've written a bit about, is what makes architecture an art? And uh, because it has to have functionality. If you create something uh, that doesn't, like the 18th century follies, that they're just, as I think somebody said in the previous discussion, they're just statues. They maybe walk through statues, and quite big statues, but they are essentially statues. So what makes architecture architecture is that it has function. What makes it art then has to be more than appearance, in my view. So I think that uh, some of it has to do with expressive features. So just to take a very hackneyed example, but the whole idea of a spire and the delicacy of a spire is in some sense to point uh, the apprehender heavenward. So that's a very natural and uh, recurrent one. Now I, uh, it depends what various traditions are trying to do, and for uh, some religious traditions will have no place for spires on their buildings. They, they don't want them because it's not there. God is in the heart, not in heaven. So I think it's just, I'd have to go through features and examples and so on, rather than have any generally, but I still think um, what, what our works of architecture do, and how they do them can be a basis for thinking about uh, how that form of art captures. Okay. Yes. Uh, I think one thing that I would like to emphasize, maybe I'm just trying when I'm thinking about different uh, subjects and their experience of places or objects or musical compositions or musical compositions in places or um, theater experiences is that there's nothing necessarily intrinsic that's going to work absolutely all the time on anyone, I think. Um, and it's the same, I would say, to my students about, uh, you know, if you didn't know that this was the place that X, Y, or Z holy thing happened and you just walked over it, you wouldn't necessarily encounter it. 
So you have to bring something to that, that you have to bring knowledge to it. So I'm not sure that we can talk about sacred architecture as having some sort of intrinsic or absolutely guaranteed sacrality for everybody all the time. Um, it's the same way with the piece of sacred art. And I think you can walk right by, I mean, always my example always is if you tell people they're going to the Sistine Chapel and they're gonna have a religious experience when they look up and see those paintings, they will have a religious experience. But if they didn't, if they didn't know that that's what that was, they would say, oh, this is a crowded place and those are really weird looking paintings. And they run running by all the Raphaels that were probably just as nice. And it's it's all prompting in some ways. And I'm really wondering about how much we bring, have to bring to the experience and that the space or the object or the whatever it is in itself may not necessarily always have it. I, 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 I wanna do a slightly different angle on this, which is um, when art is described, uh, is ascribed the, uh, the title of being art, so um, Johann Sebastian Bach, um, when he was alive, was not thought of as a composer at all. I mean, I don't think he even thought of himself as a composer. He was an organist and he had a job. And part of his job was to write a cantata for every week. And each week that cantata told a story and it was purely functional. Um, it was, it is um, in everybody's mind, certainly in mine, um, the greatest musical art ever written but it was pure functional functionality at the time. Yeah, let me let me say a couple of things. Um, one, the majority of the time of a church is not servicing mass. So it's not functional, literally speaking, at least a Christian church, Catholic church. So that brings a lot of interesting conversation here. Now, what is the function of the church? Perhaps it is to produce uh, spiritual information for the person walking in, perhaps, who knows what it is? So uh, uh, I think uh, there is a misunderstanding sometimes of the role of the church as purely, quote, functional. What is the function if it's not mass, right? Especially for Catholics. That's one quest issue that I think uh, is an important one I often bring to, to the point. Second, you know, the conversation about um, the fact that churches have two functions. One, it is to be a sacred space, whether it works or not, but it is to be a sacred space, period. <laughs> That's part of what Catholic believes and other beliefs. So whether it works or not, that we could argue that. Uh, Domus Dei is part of the job of the church, of a Catholic church. But it's also Domus uh, Ecclesiae, which is uh, a place where the, the church as community comes together. So there is a double, double uh, dimension of a church in which, of course, depends on your ideology these days, whether it's pre-Vatican or post-Vatican second, you emphasize one or the other, but a good church produces both. Uh, the last thing I want to say is that as an architect, I had to believe, and I do believe, that architecture makes a difference. Um, not statistically, statistically speaking, it makes a difference. So sure, you know, you need two to tango, no question about it. I, what I bring to the situation matters, but, what architecture puts forward, not just you, I, I hope, otherwise I will be teaching here, it produces an effect. So, I mean, to try to be political or say, well, it's all about on the, on the, on, on the relativistic side of the, of the visitor, no. <laughs> I, I, would, I, would, I would fight that, that cause, just for the record. Anybody else? <laughs> So before the next question, I just wanted, there's a wonderful teaching moment here. E, hear that note? E, every time the microphone is used there, that's resonant. <laughs> I'm trying to it's fix been driving me crazy since yesterday, and now it'll drive you crazy. I, I just wanted to follow up on Mr. Berger's comment about the musician recomposing the music. And I, I suppose the extension of the analogy would be that the, the builder recomposes the architecture or perhaps the user. Um, first of all, is that a valid extension? And if it is, what does it mean for design intent with regards to sacred space if the user and or the builder recomposes the work? I just want to make a remark about this. I mean, I, I don't want to deny at all the act of engagement of the mind uh, but there is a, a difference between 
um, improvisation and uh, somebody else's composition. So I don't deny that when people play uh, Bach and let's say Bach on the saxophones or something, there's a definite um, addition and uh, alteration and change, but still composition improvisation are in that sense different. That's all, all I want to say. I don't want to make any more of it. Uh, and I think that um, if in a way, if, if in the deepest sense, the players recompose the music, the composer will be redundant. You know, I mean, there has to be something of honoring and acknowledging the composer's intentions in what they are doing. I think that's um, that's a, a key element. Doesn't the uh, composer's intention, like any other artist's intention, don't determine everything, and nobody could slavishly follow their intentions. It's just not uh, possible. But still, I mean, uh, the artist's intention is an important factor in many expressions of, of uh, art. Um, just go back for a minute to the architecture thing and Julio's point. I, I'm repeating myself now, but there are church buildings with a function whose purpose is not to be sacred space. It is just to be a meeting place. And they are uh, reworkable, reusable as multifunctional spaces. I know lots of them. So on Sundays, they may be a place to, for the church to meet, but on Tuesdays, they're a playgroup or, or even um, a basketball court. So I think uh, the deliberate- in the Catholic Church. Sorry? Not in the Catholic Church. No, no, I understand that. I understand and, that, and, but- and Also, but, it had to be consecrated. So the consecration demands that it yeah. has to become sacred the moment you consecrate. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying, uh, when we're talking about architecture, and the architecture that goes into creating churches, it's not all architecture sure. trying to create sacred spaces. Okay. And one other point, just in relation to your remark, is that uh, I don't think anybody who thinks uh, the churches are functional thinks they're confined to, the, the function is confined to the um, celebration of the mass. They are, amongst other things, places in which to pray. And that's a functionality. That's a functionality. And then you. Thank you, Julio. I want to thank you for this rich conversation. Let's start with Julio's last point. It becomes sacred the moment you consecrate it in a Roman Catholic understanding. As a, someone who teaches in a Catholic Heritage University, I would contest that uh, because um, you really have to look at uh, sacred for whom and according to what understanding of sac sacrality. Uh, it's a big it's a big point in religious studies and theological studies today. Um, so I, I want to point out there's um, uh, a parallels between um, yesterday's presentation on mystery um, uh, by Father Valadisa and the presentation by Gordon Graham. And this, there's, there's the prehension of mystery and then the work you're doing, um, Gordon. I think there's certain parallels there. So there's kind of like a theological aesthetic kind of um, resonance between the two. Uh, but my, I guess my question is, um, when we talk about the listener recomposes the music or maybe the architecture or the crucifixion uh, images can, is explicitly theological um, and, and uh, uh, art can give facts about the life of the soul, in my work as a theologian, I'm very curious about the use of the different languages that are being deployed to to hold things together um, in a in a um, in a let's say transcendent way to to use just a bookmark word. So language of soul, theology, sacred, spiritual—they're all kind of at work here, and they're all being invoked um, and. One way to look at it, and then I'll stop. One way to look at it is that we're trying to figure out what the there is that's there. That's one way to look at it. And I think that that's kind of the, that's kind of the frame, if the discursive frame here, that there's a there there, we're trying to get there. Uh, and a different way of looking at it would be that there's not a there there, and that the invocation of these terms are helping us creatively cope 
with the language we've inherited to make meaningful sense of our world. That would be a very different way of understanding what's happening here. Um. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I just want to this. I just want to mention something about the um, role of prior knowledge in establishing a specific experience. You mentioned that uh, uh, you know if if uh, if somebody is told that this is a Catholic play a place and they are Catholic, they will probably have a religious experience. If they're told that this is you know, maybe, I don't know, uh, belongs to some other religion, they will probably not have the, the same experience. Uh, there are at least two studies uh, that that uh, I've come across uh, when it comes to art appreciation um, that recruited two groups of people. And uh, in one study, they got art from the MoMA, Museum of Modern Arts in New York City. And and they labeled it, uh, uh, they labeled half of it as MoMA, which was true, and the other half as like some art that was drawn by um, amateurs from some nursing home or something. And they asked the viewers to rate it. They consistently rated the one that they thought was from the MoMA, which it was from the MoMA, a lot higher than the other one, which also was from the MoMA. And not only that, but in the functional MRI machine, there were also some activations when they rated something high that were not present when they rated something as low. There is another study, I think, that was done in the Netherlands with a very similar design that, that derived the same conclusions. Um, <clears throat> a particular example when it comes to sacred places uh, comes from uh, uh, homes of uh, uh, places of worship that belong to a specific religion, but in a later era, is, you know, uh, belong to a different religion. Uh, a lot of such examples are in Constantinople, for example, where multiple of the Byzantine churches are now mosques. They have become and continue to be mosques. The question is, uh, you know, did the, the hypothetically, did the Muslim feel any religious experience in that place when it was still a church? And does the Christian feel any experience today when this place is named a mosque? So. <laughs> um, um, just to kind of, uh, hopefully my context helps you um, to maybe see something deeper. Um, I think that we're all trying to um, put words on an experience. Um, and architect um, and, and architecture and our surroundings evoke experience. And I think when you think of it in a spiritual context, I think of that as dogma, which is we're trying to explain something that God gives us and he gives us individually. And, and it's, it's an experience that we get through prayer, through a relationship with God. So, but in the dogma, it's important because it helps to lift us up. And it helps us to look up. And I think that's, you know, really important. To the other side of the, I'm making so many steps these days. I think my 10,000 for sure. Um, so I want to come back to, um, I think Robin, you brought up the question of, uh, you called it prompting or maybe cultural encoding and 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 you, you talked about narratives as things that bring us together and i just want to challenge that a little bit because it just dawned on me as you were saying that that it, it, could, could we think about thing um, experiences that are universal versus experiences that are culturally encoded um can we ever separate the two? And let's just think of it, uh, maybe this came up yesterday, uh, terming it the space of awe versus, uh, but I wasn't here, so I'm sure it came up. Uh, it did. <laughs> so, spaces of awe versus sacred spaces. So if you were to walk into a space and felt something, regardless of what culture you came from, or what religion you were, what your beliefs were. It, where does that fall in the line of all versus um, 
a sacred space. And I, I think it has to do with the narrative. And maybe this is an example where narratives can actually pull people apart rather than bring them together. I just would love to hear your thoughts about that. I worry a lot about this question because I think I think we have a lot of presumptions um, that we can say that everybody, that there is something that would bring awe in any visitor. I mean, maybe the Pantheon comes pretty close, but but as you notice, as Tom said, you know, not everybody knows that's a church, you know, and so sometimes it's just a just a bucket list item to check off, you know, and um so. And I think it might be the closest instance I know of where you almost get maybe 80% of the visitors having some feeling of awe, but I wouldn't say it would be 100%. And I do worry about those cultural differences. I really do. And I think about this because my students in my class right now all, I think, are sort of thinking that Gothic is the most spiritual and transcendent kind of architecture. And I don't know that that would work in Finland. You know, I'm not sure it'd work in Africa. So. I wonder about, you know, and, and one of the, my favorite churches is very cave-like. And so it isn't, doesn't, it isn't about height. It's not about heavens are above. It's something different that happens to me. But I know that the next person in that, and this is, I'm, I'm referencing my, one of my favorite churches, which is the Marcel Breuer Chapel in, in College of Minnesota, if those of you who know it. And there are people who think it's the ugliest thing they've ever walked into, you know? So I don't know. I mean, I, and I don't think it's a Catholic church and it's consecrated and all of that, but I don't think that everybody has the same experience in that place. So how do we account, how do we resist the generalizing, universalizing, um, which could bring us to fearfully sometimes to sort of a Eurocentric point of view about things like Gothic architecture? Yes. I'm sort of intrigued about a little tension that I hear in comments and questions. On the one hand, there's the insistence, which we had a little while ago, that art is never passively received. It's always actively engaged with. And then we get this great worry that people are somehow too actively engaged in receiving the art. I mean, you can't have it both ways, I think. Um, is it a worry or is it not? And I will take my uh, stand on saying, no, we don't passively receive aesthetic experience. Of course, we actively bring things to it. But it's a mistake to think that thereby we're distorting or twisting or bending the thing. But I just want to come back to uh, something else about architecture. I'm also struck by how the uh, religious emotion that everybody has referred to almost exclusively is awe. Uh, and uh, okay, yes, awe and wonder, but uh, in the range, traditional range of religious emotions, there's also uh, the feeling of mortality, uh, the sense of sin. Uh, these are things, here's something I just want to say about some churches. I don't, they may not produce awe, I have no idea. Uh, let's say, uh, but uh, some places he will find it easier to pray in. And that ease, the easiness with which they pray tells you something, in my view, about uh, the way in which the building accommodates both a sense of sin and a sense of mortality. And so I just want to say we, we've been a bit limited uh, in our account of uh, emotions and architecture. Thank you. Um, let's give the, give the, the people a hand. Thank you very much.